So here's my untouched source image. And here is my the image that I'm going to take from. So I'm just going to turn them both on so we can see this happen in real time. And then in order to borrow the color from this image and map it onto this one, I go up into the image menu. And I go down to, excuse me, I go to the, um, whoops, I have to be on the layer that I want to borrow and take from, and add to. I go to image, adjustments. So you want to add to or take You know, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that they were both lit up. And you won't get the adjustments menu if you're on a layer that's not turned on. That's a mistake I made. I just had to turn it on. You get to the adjustments menu. And you'll notice a lot of these things are the same as what you see down here when you click on this. But the one that's not there is match color. Now, match color cannot be used on a smart object. You won't be able to shift it once you create it. So you go to match color, and it brings up this dialog here. Hope you can all see that, yeah. It has options for how that color maps on. But the most important part of this is where your source is, because if you don't have a source loaded, you're never going to make any changes to the layer. So in this case, I go to the source, and I say match color test, because that's the file we're in. If your image was on a separate file, you'd see a list here of your open images. And you choose the one that is your source file. But then you also have to choose which layer. So in this case, I really need the Sport Safion test layer as my source. And once I load that, it starts to splash all of this color onto this photo. But it does it in a very garish way because I haven't changed the luminance values. Luminance is the darkness or lightness of how that effect's going to be laid on. So as I move the luminance slider down, it brings the original photo back into its normal gamma or its brightness. And you can see that the bluish tones and the reddish tones of the Saffion layer are being imposed onto what was before a very faded colored image. Well, I'm not after realism on this one. I'm after just kind of showing you. So there's two answers to that, yes and yes. Um, it can, in which case, it's a good idea to have a copy of the original layer below so that you can mask away the changes. And that, that's a really good question to bring up, and I'll address how that's done visually after this. So you change your luminance to bring back whatever tones you, were, you liked in your original. And then you can also vary the intensity of the effect. And neutralize does exactly what you think. And so it's worth just checking it on and off. It attempts to take some of the overtones away. Like I notice when it's unchecked, I'm seeing a lot of the green spilling into the skin here. But what it does is it looks for things that are not heavily colored in the original. And it starts to take away the effect of it right there. So right away, that sort of corrects the skin tones a little bit. But it's one of those things you have to try. So that's color intensity chooses how much of the color spills in. And I'm going to bring it up pretty high just so that we can see the effect really well in the, in the projection here. And then fade does exactly what you think it would do. It fades the effect so that if I was putting the fade at 100, there's no effect whatsoever. So you can choose how much of that color that you want to impose on the new image actually shows up. I'm going to leave the fade down here for the purposes of this exercise just so you can kind of see how much of the color really burns in. Now, it's not going to take the lightest, Im the lightest parts of the image and burn color onto them because it really works by looking at the tonal values and the existing colors that were already there and then imposing the new color on top of it. We'll get to what this does um, separately. And your end result looks like that. So really, it's the same image that you saw before, but it just has a lot of these colors mapped onto it. 
Um, say again? Well, here's how you would do that. So I'm going to undo this, and I'll go through the same process, but I'll make a copy of this layer first. Um, fastest way is Command J, or I can just drag this onto the new layer icon. And now I'm going to do the same thing over again, which is what I intended to do so I could repeat it and show it to you twice so it would sync in a little bit better. Now I'm going to go back to Image Menu, Adjustments, Find Match Color way down here. I have to go and get the source, which is the same file I'm in in this case, and I have to change the layer not to the one that's selected, which defaults here, but to the Sapion test shoot. I bring the luminance down, and I bring the color intensity to however much I want to impose that color on the new image, and I can fade in order to control so think about this. Think of the color intensity is almost like saying saturation, but fade is the effect in totality. Right? So if I fade the effect completely, then there's no change. The only change you'll see is what I've done here with luminance. But fading allows you to choose how much of this effect gets imposed on the image. So I'm going to say OK to that. Get the luminance back a little bit. And now here's the answer to the question about masking. So now that I have all those changes on a layer above the original, all I have to do is make a mask and then use a brush loaded with black. My, my tools are a little messed up here. Find out why. There they are. So I've got my black color loaded. I always check when I do a brush to make sure that the opacity is what I want it to be, in this case 100%. Looks like I used a really big brush before. So I'm going to hold down my control and option, bring that way down, because that's the fastest way to change a brush. And I'm also going to need to have a pretty hard edge brush. I don't use 100% hard edge. I always feather it just a tiny bit so it looks realistic. And then all I have to do if I want to retain the original skin color is go here and mask. So I think that's what you were referring to, right? Now, obviously, if I wanted to mask all of their skin, that would be a lot more work. And I'd have to go and either do it by hand, or it might be easier to even make a selection first. I'll just do a rough one here so we can kind of move at a decent pace. Once that's selected, I can go back to my mask, grab my brush again, and now I can brush pretty much freehand without accidentally going off the edges. If I'm in if I'm in any selection tool it's pretty easy to select things even if you're not on that specific layer. So even though I've got any layer, it doesn't matter really what layer is open at the time, or if I'm even still in the mask itself, I can still select and increase my, my chances of brushing into the right place. And it's important to know when you use the select tool that you need to always have your hand or, or finger near the option key so that you can take away from an accidental over selection. And then when you let that key up, you're back to actively selecting. So all I'm doing is I'm trying to protect areas of the image that I don't want to mask. It's not really a selection exercise. I'm just kind of going through this pretty quickly here. I'm holding down. You can't see me holding down the option. It doesn't show up on the screen. but Whenever you see me deselecting, that's what I'm doing. And then going to the mask, again, I just take the black brush. And I can protect any area that I want just by brushing into it. Let's 
So that's on that image. And then I've given you a second set of images to try. So I'm going to turn this one off and open up the one or uh, turn it on, the one that called Forests for Match Color down here at the bottom, different group. Move my panels over. So same thing applies here. And I'm going to make a second copy of the layer, Command J. So I've got one that's being adjusted and one that's just sort of a default. And make sure that the one that is your your original layer is below and the one that you're working on is the one on top. Otherwise you won't see your effect because it'll be covered by the copied layer. And what we're going to do is just go back into match color and this time pick up the colors from the misty forest and impose them onto this one. Now they're both forest shots so it's not going to be like the ground looks exactly like this and the forest looks exactly like this because there's a lot of bleed over. But let's see what happens. So I'm going to go up into Image, Adjustments, Match Color. I have to go and choose which layer. And in this case, it's the Woods Cool Misty. And as soon as you click on that as your layer source, it immediately changes the whole spectrum of the what was it originally a green forest. But it looks kind of surreal because it's using a lot of reds. And that's one of the things about match color is it's going to pick up pixels that you may not even detect and use them as coloration. And it's going to merge those colors with the whatever colors were underneath. So in this case, it's taking this tone here and it's adding this tone to it. So that's why you have to do a little bit of masking or at least have a way of controlling that. Change the color intensity so that it's less garish. Fix the luminosity if it got hammered by the picking up the other color. And even use neutralize if it helps you get your target met. So the, the main point is just so that you see how you can take the color spectrum from one, one image and impose it on the other. But there's still work to be done. You've got to decide whether some of it was incorrectly recolored. And that's why we use a mask. So I'm going to go and mask that, just as I did before. Only this time, just to see if it works, I'm going to try the color range tool that we looked at, I think, on week two or three. And just for the hell of it, I'm going to try to see if I can pick up that color and maybe do an automatic selection of all of these, looks like almost pinkish ground pixels, just to see if that works. Might be a little bit of a far cry, but I'm just going to give it a chance, see if I can do it. Looks like it is picking up a lot of those. I'm going to say OK. And I'm going to use Command H to hide the marching ants. That's what they call these little selection things that are moving. I'm going to go over to the mask and I'm just going to paint with black in the area that was selected by color range. And by having pre-selected those, I have a better chance of finding them as I move my brush around this image. It even found some that were up here in the bushes. And I may use a lower opacity brush when I do this, because otherwise, each stroke I make is working the brush at 100%. I like to use my brushes at a lower opacity unless I know that I need to completely obliterate something in a mask. And that way, I can go over several strokes and get it right. So that's a way of sort of correcting this forest floor um, by having pre-selected the colors in it. Or you could just do it by freehand. You'd probably be doing a little bit more work, especially if you needed to get in here. So what Color Range does is it just helps you find the colored pixels that you want to change.
And that's all there is to it. Yeah. 